So we want to talk about nutrition, brain health. You're going to see lots of um, seminars, webinars, all sorts of educational things on nutrition and brain health. Um, as I said, you know, when we were in medical school, we didn't get much training on that. So what most clinicians know about nutrition is pretty much what they learned on their own efforts. However, um, what, what gets me concerned is the standards that we have for nutrition in this country. The standards are written by large groups of people who are gathered together. I'm not sure who's the boss of those groups, but there's usually 30 or 40 professionals get together and decide what everyone should eat or shouldn't eat. And those standards, usually USDA, and the panels that are, that are people deciding what we should eat or recommend we eat are made up of people mostly from the food industry, Nestle's, uh, uh, General Mills, or the pharmaceutical industry. So do we want the food industry to tell us what foods we should eat? Do we think that's a good idea? Because whenever people talk nutrition, they say, follow the money. And uh, I hate to say it's probably true in nutrition as much as anything. So in our program, I really, really would love to find a nutritionist or two that we could refer our clients to. But the ones that exist, uh, it would take me a long time to vet them to know what they know. Um, but what the real registered licensed nutritionists have to say is what the USDA recommendations are. And the USDA recommendations are that you need at least 40% of your calories from carbohydrates, preferably 60%. And you need 10% of your calories from sugar. Well, what I read is humans do not need a single grain of sugar. We can exist without a single grain of sugar. But somebody who had input on the recommendation said you need 10%. There it is. And so I have a real problem with trying to get people guided on nutrition. Uh, we're busy dealing with uh, nutrition, much of what our evaluation covers. So um, what I'm about to say in this uh, next uh, 45 minutes or so is a reflection of that concern. So in, you know, as I said, people want you to teach um, evidence-based medicine to get approval for three hours of continuing medical education credit for this meeting, I had to prove that what I'm saying is medically credible. And they want you to have evidence base. Now, I can bend the rules a little bit. But um, if we only do what has already been done, are we going to improve? If we never innovate, are we going to improve? I think not. And our current system is not working. Complex medical care is getting out of hand, and nobody wants to do complex medical care. 10 diagnoses, 15 drugs, that's complicated, complex medical care. You lose your shirt doing that if you do that business, unless you charge cash at a boutique med medicine clinic. Now, we don't want to be a, a boutique medicine clinic. We want to treat everybody. But we need to have, find a way that everyone can get treated. But nutrition is uh, ever evolving. I change my opinion on things every year or so. New things are saying, no, that's good, no, that's bad, no, that's good, no, that's bad. And remember, anything I say here today where I'm suggesting that it's a good thing may not be right for you. If I tell you to eat green leafy things and you're on Coumadin, that's not a good idea. Coumadin works by binding vitamin K, so it cannot work. And that's how it keeps your blood thin. And so people on Coumadin, uh, dicumarol, there are several names for Coumadin, um, should not eat green leafy things unless their doctor approves it. So there's a lot of controversy in nutrition. Kim and I just listened to an online webinar, actually a eight or so lecture series on food. And this uh, guy was push, pushing uh, plant-based whole foods only, no animal products whatsoever. I personally don't believe in that. The people we see 
are mostly 65 years of age and older. And when you speak medically about recommendations based on guidelines, the guidelines are based on people mostly studied who are between the ages of 35 and 55. Well, we don't, we don't see very many of those folks. So our recommendations are specifically tailored to the age group and the sex of the person we're talking to. So it's hard to make recommendations that blanket good, this is blanket good for everybody. Although there's a few like that. I can't think of any good reason why blueberries would be bad for somebody. I'm sure somebody will come up with, oh, you get a blueberry piece on your teeth <laughs> and you give a big talk and you got a little piece of blueberry on your teeth like Rosanna Denna, remember her? Uh, you got that little piece of blueberry. But, um, but global recommendations are difficult. So in our two to three hour evaluations, we talk nutrition quite a bit. And it's nutrition according to what I believe and what I believe is sifted through hours and hours reading books like these and lots of articles and so forth. So that's what I'm gonna give you today. So I'm gonna nerd out just a little bit here and talk about this as a neuron cell. In your brain, this is the worker cell in your brain and there are many different kinds of neurons. So I'm gonna just describe to you the generic neuron. In your brain, there's somewhere between 85 and 120 billion of these. They're vital, they're all interconnected. See those little spikes going out all over? They're interconnected way more than this illustration shows. And in the center is a nucleus that has the genetic material. Those little green jelly beans are mitochondria, the energy forming packets inside your cell. And this is a way underrepresented because the artist needed to leave room. But in a nerve cell, a brain cell, there's probably 3,000 mitochondria in each one. The job of the mitochondria is to provide energy for metabolic function of this cell. This cell will die if it doesn't have enough energy. Where does it get its energy from? Glucose comes through the cell and penetrates through the cell wall, is brought in. Oxygen comes in, that's necessary as well. Glucose doesn't get through the cell unless you have insulin that's working. And insulin doesn't work unless you have something called nitric oxide to make the insulin work. The final common pathway in almost all of us with dementia is that doesn't work. The cells forget how to use glucose, which is the basic fuel. It also can use ketones, which we'll discuss. But glucose for most of us is the basic fuel. Glucose, however, is crude oil. And you can't put crude oil in your car to get the engine. You have to refine that. And that's what the mitochondria do. They convert that crude oil, which is glucose, into ATP, which is the rocket fuel for your nerve cell and other cells in your body. Which cells in your body have the most mitochondria? Heart and brain. Your brain never stops. Even when you're sleeping, your brain is still working. Your heart never stops or you stop. And so mitochondria are very important in those cells. And a lot of people think that dementia, no matter what kind, or neurodegenerative uh, disease, and there are many diseases that have different names, but the final common pathway, energy failure in the neuron cell. And as I said, there are many brands of neurons. There's different kinds that do different things. But in general, uh, Dr. Bredesen describes it as network failure. Each one of these 85 billion 100 billion, they're all interconnected to each other. It's a redundant network. And Dr. Bredesen describes all neurodegeneration as network failure. And if the, each cell is starting to underperform, it doesn't transmit the impulses, it's still sucking up oxygen, still sucking up the crude oil, glucose, but not doing its work, there's a kill switch and it's killed. It has a autophagy which kills it. You might say, well, that's gonna be bad. Well, just think of how you prune an apple tree. Apple tree won't produce if it has all kinds of sucker branches. You have to prune those. Well, think of this as pruning. Your brain is fabulous. The reason it takes 30 years for you to get symptoms from when the process starts is because there's this autophagy, this killing off of the, the slow ones that aren't doing the job. And that's, that's how we don't get symptoms for 30 years. Well, 
million years ago, people didn't live beyond age 30 or 40. So it wasn't really necessary that you have this. But um, our diet today is causing energy failure in our neurons. And it doesn't matter if you're calling it Parkinson's or if you're calling it MS or if you're calling it uh, Huntington's Korea or some other name, it's nerve failure. The, the neuron cells fail. They don't get enough energy and quite often they get the kill switch and they die. So we didn't learn any of that in medical school. That was, but, um, and I'm just nerding out on this one cell here uh, because that's real important for what I'm gonna say about nutrition. So our meds for d dementia, in my opinion, really don't work that good. And I know the Alzheimer's Association people are here and they really believe in drugs, but in our experience, they don't work that good. And in fact, when you look at the studies on hundreds of thousands of people who took the most popular uh, dementia drug, their brains deteriorated faster than the control group that didn't take anything. So that's discouraging to me. You know, I was raised in medical school, which taught me that Every disease is just absence of the right drug and drugs are where it's at and you could write a prescription in three minutes and take care of everything. Uh, but in dementia, it's not true. So wouldn't prevention be a better card to play in this um, system of trying to deal with dementia? Prevention is way better. And you know, we as Americans, we've come to you know, the, the quintessential American investment in their own health is the overhead drone view of someone driving through the COVID line. They just stick their arm out the window, get a shot and on their way. That's the extent of most of our efforts to help our own health. We can do better than that and we need to do better. And this is something you can do whether your clinician has time to tell you this or not. You can do this. And even if you don't have dementia, you can do it so you don't get dementia. I believe that that's true. Now, you can't, they always say you can't run away from a bad diet. Well, you can't diet your way away from dementia risk. You need a good diet, but you need to do all the other things that we're gonna talk about. You need to exercise, you need to keep your weight down. You need to get proper sleep. If you have sleep apnea, you get a treat. You need to quit smoking. You need to work on social interaction and fight that loneliness. If you have depression, get it treated. Uh, so nutrition is a big part of this. But if you don't do all the rest of it, you know, eating uh, kale is gonna save you. you know, even when you get those stems stuck in your teeth, it's not gonna save you. Um, you need to do the whole package is the point. We become what we eat. I've heard people say that and I always was mystified by that. But in your brain, in that nerve cell that we uh, talked about, there's, imagine there's a, a team all around the membrane and each day it takes the bricks that that membrane is made out of and gets rid of the bad ones, grabs what's ever available and sticks another one in there. Those are fat molecules. And if they reach out and grab a bad fat molecule like omega-6, that's like putting a hand grenade in your brick wall. It oxidizes quickly and will create brain inflammation and lead to dementia. Every day your brain, each cell membrane, of each and every neuron is substituting out the ones that are nearly oxidized and reaching whatever is available and putting it back into the brick wall of your, of your membrane of your brain cell. And if all that's available is omega-6 from the bag of chips that's cooked in corn oil or some other seed oil, the, those are packed with omega-6s. Uh, even olive oil has a little bit of omega-6, but the omega-3 is way better. Omega-3 is good. Omega-6, not so good. Now you need omega-6. It's obligate, you have to have some omega-6, but you can get all the omega-6 you need without even trying. You don't have to worry about that. But this is one principle of nutrition that you should all read about and learn about. And I finally found, you know, cause I, I go through the chip aisle all the time looking at the vet products to see what's, and they're cooking them in avocado oil. Yeah. Finally, there's not, and avocado is a fruit, it's not a seed. And olive is a fruit and not a seed. So if it's cooked, now it's expensive to cook it in real olive oil. And avocado oil and, and uh, olive oil are best, but you know, you've got a better than even chance that what you picked up that says avocado oil, that's not really avocado oil. 
better than even chance when you pick up and it says olive oil, it's not really olive oil. It may be 10 or 20% olive oil, but the rest is rapeseed oil, canola oil, which is loaded with omega-6s, which the guy, the guy that's building your cell wall is gonna grab those omega-6s and stick it in there. It's like putting a hand grenade in your wall instead of a brick. And think of it that way. I think that's easier nutrition. Now this is nerding out and I'm getting into the molecules which my colleagues always kid me about. But you know, if you know why you don't wanna eat chips cooked in an omega-6 oil, it's easier to pass that by and not have those chips. Or at least look for the ones that says avocado oil. I don't know if it really cooked in avocado oil. I'd have to see it to believe it. But um, there was a whole thing on 60 Minutes about the um, counterfeit olive oil. It started in Italy and you know, if you can get $50 a bottle for olive oil and you can make it 80% rapeseed oil and still call it olive oil. Even in the restaurant, when you say I want olive oil, they only, if it's 51% olive oil, they can call it olive oil. That's the rule. So rapeseed oil, canola oil is high in omega-6s. It oxidizes easily. Oxidation leads to inflammation. Inflammation tears down those cells that we showed you. Omega-6, you'll get all the omega-6 you want just being an American. You don't have to go out and look for it. And the big thing is omega-6s will lower your bad cholesterol, which is like the golden, what do they call that? The what? Well, the, well, no, the omega-6 is the one that will um, actually, it'll actually lower your bad cholesterol. Now, that's not true of omega-3s. Omega-3s sometimes can raise your LDL cholesterol, but we, as doctors, were trained, elevated LDL cholesterol equals death. Not so, not so, and that's heresy to say that. If you said that at a cardiology convention, you'd be shot. So, when, the, when you go to the canola guy and you say, well, I'm not going to use your seed oil anymore, he says, yeah, but it lowers your LDL cholesterol. Yeah, but does it make you live longer? No, but it lowers your LDL cholesterol. So we have to get away from that. And some of the good things that I would recommend, the omega-3s, may raise your LDL slightly. It doesn't happen in everybody, but some people it does. Uh, like, um, we recommend a lot of people use coconut oil to saute things. It's a lot of saturated fat. It has very little linoleic acid. It's very unlikely to cause oxidation and damage, and actually it helps you develop ketones in your blood, which is the other rocket fuel. Ketones gets into your cell, it's rocket fuel right away. It doesn't need to be converted by those jelly bean mitochondria. So, um, and that's a whole nother thing, talking about ketones as alternative fuel. You know, as we get older, we don't do as well utilizing sugar for fuel. That's, and they do a FDG glucose scan to see where in your brain sugar isn't being utilized. It's a test, $6,000 or something. Um, but um, your brain never forgets how to use ketones. And what are ketones? Well, ketones is an alternative uh, fuel source, when you absorb body fat, when you dissolve body fat because you don't eat for 14 hours, you're bringing ketones into your blood. You bring ketones into your blood when you saute your uh, spinach in coconut oil, or when you add MCT powder to your coffee to whiten it, you're, uh, you're increasing the ketones in your blood, and your brain never forgets how to use ketones for rocket fuel. Even if you're 120 years old, Ketones works right away as instant fuel. And so people say, well, why is a, a low carb, even ketogenic diet good? Well, there's a lot of things um, that it pushes your brain towards using ketones where it now fails to utilize glucose. That's a small part of it. It does a bunch of other things too. You're gonna to hear people talk about bad things in your blood that result from digestion of food. TMAO uh, is trimethylamine oxide. When you eat red meat, when you eat eggs, when you eat cheese, TMAO goes up. But it only goes up because the germs, the good germs, not so good germs in our intestine convert the protein the amino acids, particular ones, in the red meat, the eggs, or the animal products, into TMAO, 
but then it goes to your liver and it turns into something with the O on the end of it, which is bad for you, contributes to heart disease and all that. However, there's many ways you can reduce that. So the people that tell you you can't eat any meat, you can't have any eggs, you can't have any dairy, I don't agree with that because I think you can overcome arguments like the TMAO argument with other things nutrition-wise. If you take a person who's been on a very low-carb diet for a while and you give them a steak, they hardly make any TMAO. So there's ways around that. So Kim and I just listened to, uh, I don't know if you did all of them, but I did four or five of them, talking about TMAO and why uh, meat is not so good for you, but I don't agree with that. But I did, as I mentioned before, I recommend if you have beef, it'd be grass-fed beef. And so um, it turns out that the financial powers of the food industry, and you know, if you look at profit margins of all the industries in the United States, one of the biggest profit margins is the food industry. Who would have thought? Followed closely by the drug industry and several others in between. They make a huge profit. And they, how do they make a profit? By making things taste good. And they make a profit by making the cereal boxes so thin they look like a book <laughs> you know, on your shelf, uh, making the smaller contents and so forth. Um, but uh, the wrong people are having an influence on what we eat and how we eat. When you go to the grocery store, if you look at all the products in the grocery store, more than 50% of them have added sugar. And what's worse than sugar? High fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup. It tastes really sweet. It's dirt cheap, has an eternal half-life. It works really good in a product, and people buy the food because it tastes so darn good. Why does barbecue sauce taste so good? It's half sugar. It's sweet. And sweet sells. And so their profit margin is maintained by you buying the salad dressing that's got high fructose corn syrup, uh, it's the barbecue sauce, it's all kinds of other uh, piccani sauce or whatever, it, and there's a lot of sweetness in there. It's just really hard to get new ideas to catch on. There's no um, cachet to having a new way of eating. It's not like, uh, um, who's the big uh, concert person that, the lady? Uh, Gaga? Not Lady Gaga, but uh, <laughs> the one that they, they sold all the tickets in one day. Oh, Taylor. Who? Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Yeah, now that garners attention. You know, it's a Taylor Swift kind of, people talk about that, but you don't talk about a low carb diet preserving your brain. It just doesn't have the, the glitziness. You know, people like to talk about stuff that's really glitzy, but. Um, so new ideas in terms of uh, food don't catch on very well. And then there's so much controversy because anybody and his brother can make a production and put it on the internet and it looks like an authority. And maybe it's not so good. Doesn't matter, they can still put it on the internet. You can go look at it. It's sort of like politicians, they all argue all sides of the story so much and after a while you're so confused, you don't know what to vote for. And it works, it works. So I want to talk about a couple of molecules. And again, my, my uh, colleagues are going to kid me, but I'm, I'm extracting two tiny little things to talk about in particular that very much has to do with nutrition and probably has to do with almost every inflammatory condition you can think of. Coronary artery disease is, I consider an inflammatory condition. Rheumatoid arthritis, any arthritis, any inflammatory colitis, you name it, and it has inflammation at its core. And metabolism that gets messed up can have markers like uric acid. Uric acid used to be tested uh, in the lab routinely. It was part of a chemical profile because it was a gout causer. It causes gout, particularly in men, but it can happen in women. Certain drugs can raise your uric acid. And when we do our evaluations, we always ask the referring clin clinician please do a uric acid. It used to be done automatically almost every time you did a blood test. 
But hardly anybody talks about gout anymore because we have drugs that treat gout pretty well. Allopurinol is the first line. But uh, one of the uh, books, um, this one here by Richard Johnson, he's also a um, archeologist and looks into ancient humans and so forth. A couple million years ago, hominid, our hominid ancestors developed a lack of an enzyme called uricase so that they could survive the winter. And lacking that caused your uric acid to go up and cause you to metabolize differently so that you would get, uh, when you'd eat all the fruits in the fall, you would get a lot of fructose in your blood, which broke down in your liver into uric acid and triglycerides. The triglycerides went into body fat. And it turns out if you've got a lot of body fat, you're more likely to survive the deprivation of winter. There was a reason for that. And several other hominids, not humans, but they have the same mutation at the same time in history. And usually that's an advantage when multiple organisms get the same mutation. Now, if you go to the zoo and you draw the blood of a gorilla, their uric acid will be three or less. You get the average man on the street, it'll be 6.5 or seven. And the book, or actually when you do the lab test, they put the normal afterwards. And the normal is considered anything below seven. Anywhere from 5.5 .5 to seven, you're, you have excess uric acid. Not enough to cause gout. Gout is a real painful joint at the base of your big toe for most people. It can be in your knee or other. Any joint that's cooler than the rest of your body can get gout. It's red, it's swollen, it's hot, it's tender. A bed sheet can't even touch it. That's how bad gout is. So it's good to prevent gout. But that's the least of your worries with uric acid. Uric acid hurts your blood vessels. And what's bad for your blood vessels is bad for your brain. And so that's why I think it's so important to know what your uric acid is. And your doctor will say, oh, you're normal at 6.5. Well, I've heard that anything about 5 or 5.5, it's hurting my blood vessels. I don't want any of my blood vessels to be bad. And there are over-the-counter ways to treat uric acid, but um, allopurinol is mostly safe. There's a rare occasional side effect. It's a generically available medication, and it will very effectively lower most people's uric acid. Quercetin, which you can buy over the counter, does the same thing, but don't mess with anything like that until you talk to your doctor about it. But you don't want your uric acid to be above 5.5. And I think it's very important for vascular health. And the reason it's important is because it toxifies and prevents the formation of nitric oxide, which is the next molecule I'm gonna talk about. Nitric oxide deficiency. It's 11. And we have the, um, the exhibits at 11.15, so I just wanted to give you a time frame. We have 15 minutes. Well, if you want questions afterwards, you got five. I, I can burn through this in five minutes, so I'll do it. But you need to know that fructose is bad. You say, well, there's fructose in my apple. Well, that's okay because the fiber of the skin will slow the absorption of fructose. Don't worry about that, but the apple juice you can drink 18 ounces of apple juice and your fructose goes to the moon because you drink it fast. And that's not what you want to do. You don't want fruit juices, but you do want to eat the apple. Don't worry about the little bit. Now, if you ate 30 apples, okay, maybe we'll get a big load of fructose. But we were kids, we'd go and pick apples at the orchard and I think my brother and I would eat about 15 apples and we didn't realize we were hurting our brain when we did that, but it was a lot of fun. But if your blood glucose gets above 120, after a meal, it's not impossible. In fact, most of us Americans over 50 have insulin resistance, and we're over 120 quite a bit of the day after a meal. When it goes over 120, your metabolism shifts the glucose into fructose. Fructose goes to your liver, creates uric acid, and it makes you fat by giving you more triglycerides to store right here in preference, the belly fat. So fructose, not so good. Uh, and what uric acid does, it toxifies the blood vessels directly by tying up your production, preventing your production, neutralizing the nitric oxide that you do make in your blood vessels. And that's my next molecule. Well, first of all, uh, these are two books that we have up here, and we're going to have a drawing about that. Nature Wants Us to Be Fat by Dr. Johnson and Dr. David Perlmutter who's a neurologist. He has a, a podcast called The Empowering Neurologist. 
He doesn't mean LSD acid. He means dropping uric acid, but catchy name for a book. So nitric oxide, it's in every blood vessel. Your blood vessels make nitric oxide until you're 40 years old. And then it starts to drop off, such that by the time you're 65, you're only making 20% of the nitric oxide you need for good blood vessel health. If your blood vessels are unhealthy, you'll have hypertension. You'll have more vascular disease. You need nitric oxide. And you get nitric oxide by two ways, only two ways. One is your blood vessels make it, and the other is from what you eat. And what you eat needs to contain nitrates. The nitrates in the greens or beets, it, it hits the good germs in the back of your tongue. Who would have thought the germs in the back of your tongue was necessary to make nitric oxide <laughs> or to help you in any way? But you need those germs. And those germs take the nitrate in the plant, convert it to nitrate, send it to your stomach. And if your stomach has acid, it converts the process, sends it back to your salivary glands, and every time you swallow, you get more nitric oxide as a result. It's complicated. But if you kill those germs, and how do you kill those germs? What mouthwash kills 99.99% .99 of the germs? People who do that regularly have 30% more hypertension and an increased risk of dementia by 30%. Daily use of mouthwash that's antiseptic. Now, there are some that are just perfumed, but the ones that are antiseptic and use it regularly, you've, you've got an increased risk for dementia. And, and your blood vessels won't be as healthy. And if your blood vessels are unhealthy, what's bad for the blood vessels? Bad for the brain, right? So, and by the time we're older, after age 65, we don't make much nitric oxide and we require the, the foods that have nitrates in it. And they've tested the foods. In Chicago, they're different than the foods in California. It's different from the foods in Florida. Nitrate is all over the chart. And if you grow your greens in depleted soil, you won't have much of this in it. If you grow your greens in healthy soil that's had good farming methods to maintain the quality of the soil, you'll have way more nitrate. So there are greens and then there's greens. Depends where they were raised and how they were raised. I think I got most of that. So this system of making more nitric oxide won't work if you take an antacid, proton pump inhibitor. It won't work if you use mouthwash. And um, exercise does promote nitric oxide. So we always wonder, why is exercise so good for us? Well. It promotes the formation of nitric oxide, which is good for your blood vessels, which is good for your brain. Anything that's good for your blood vessels is good for your brain. And it gets back to nitric oxide. Never taught us that in medical school. Uh, here's the book uh, by Dr. Bryan, who's a PhD, writes extensively, and that's one of the books we're going to give away, but I'd recommend it. It's uh, only about 100 pages, and it's, it's written in a, a, a style that most of us can understand. But nitric oxide is, they're looking to way you can take supplements of nitric oxide. You know, there was a pill that was being used for in an experimental trial for uh, primary pulmonary hypertension. That's an exotic heart condition. At the end of the study, none of the men would give the pills back. That pill was sildenafil, which is Viagra. And it was used to treat primary pulmonary hypertension. Uh, because it puts a lot of nitric oxide into the circulation. But it works better if you um, have the proper diet and you exercise and all the other things. But they're looking to get supplements, which would be sodium nitroxide, they call it, or something else, where you can build it, but you can't cheat. You still need to exercise. So what should we be eating? I'm glad you asked that question. I have a slide for that. <laughs> Oh, you're good, Kim. So um, I think that animal products are OK in moderation, uh, but um, I have no problem with avocados. If you eat an avocado a day, um, I can't see that would be a problem as long as you can accommodate the calories. Avocado is a fruit. It's a really good thing. I think vegetables, especially the dark greens, those are all good. Uh, the non-starchy vegetables. 
I don't eat much potatoes anymore. I do eat yams, the ones that are purple on the outside and orange on the inside. My wife and I will split one of those and cook it in the air fryer once a, a week or so. Color is good. Anything that's brightly colored is good. Get the onions that are red or purple on the outside, not the white ones. Color is good. If it's organic and it's really organic, I'd recommend that because you're less likely to have glyphosate, which is Roundup on it, or other pesticides or things. So if it's really organic, I'd say go for it. A lot of times it's really not organic. But if it is, that would be better. It's a little more expensive. The, the fruits don't look as pretty. The vegetables don't look as pretty. They look like this carrot on this book cover. Uh, but um, the high fructose corn syrup is probably the number one takeaway I would have you avoid in terms of foods to avoid. Uh, corn syrup isn't much better. Uh, corn syrup is just pure glucose. And you know, by the way, table sugar is half fructose. It's a, a, it's a, a, a two sugars combined. It's glucose plus fructose pasted together. So a teaspoon of table sugar is half fructose. And your body will convert excess sugar to fructose. And fructose you don't want. The omega-6s, which is any seed oil, uh, almost all oils that you can buy are already rancid by the time you pick them up. When they sit out in the open with the fluorescent lights for a couple of months before someone comes along and buys them, they're half rancid. Uh, and deteriorated. And when you heat an oil about 400 degrees, it deteriorates into an oxidation bomb for your body. And how many times do you think, when you buy french fries at 8 o'clock at um, a fast food place, how many times do you think that oil has been heated throughout the day to make this the 40th batch of french fries? So you're getting an oxidation bomb when you do that. Um, and anything that... Um, promotes diabetes or glucose uh, is, a, is a real problem. I do want to mention, I know we just have a couple of minutes left, but HNE, you're going to hear a lot about HNE, and that stands for 4 hydroxy nonanol. It's something that's given off when you oxidize the omega-6 fats. The linoleic acid is the real bomb uh, in, in the omega-6 fats. And when it oxidizes, it turns to this HNE, and you're going to read a lot about it because HNE makes you fat. It makes you fat even when you eat the same calories as your non-fat neighbor who's exactly like you. It makes you fat when you're eating normal calories. HNE comes from oxidizing of cheap seed oil. So you're going to read a lot about that. We don't have time to go into it, but I'd encourage you to look that up. We're getting um, some questions coming in. Okay. And um, um, I did want to put in a plug for blueberries. I already plugged the avocados. Brain berries. Yeah, brain berries and um, macadamias. I've heard nutritionists with some knowledge say, if I had to go to Desert Island, I only had one food, I would bring macadamias. One, one thing you can write this down, Joel Furman is a family doctor who does a lot of nutrition. He talks about G-BOM, that's his acronym, greens, berries, onions, mushrooms, beans, and seeds. G-BOMs, really good for you. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, and we didn't Get say fiber. Other. One thing I do want to put in a plug for is water and fiber. Some people don't drink enough water, and you really need to drink water. If you eat salt and salty foods and don't drink water, you'll get fat. Salt will make you fat, unless you drink water. When you eat the pizza and you're drinking water all night, just keep drinking, because you need to neutralize. In, in, in nature, when you eat salt so much that it increases the salt in your blood, nature says you're starving, you need to eat more. That's the, and you will. So salt will make you fat. Unless you neutralize it with enough water, you need water. And you need fiber. Humans today have maybe 10 grams of fiber. Primitive humans, a million years ago, 70 grams of fiber. We need to get closer to that. Sugar, brown sugar, honey, maple syrup, and sugar substitutes, 30 I hope, seconds. <laughs> I, I helped my friend Joe Winter make maple syrup most years. And, it's a blast. You take 40 gallons of this, looks like water, turns into this little tiny bottle of maple syrup. But boy, does that taste good. 
I think adapted that's okay. I think honey, especially if it's grown locally, there's good reasons why locally processing grown honey is good. It helps with allergies if you have hay fever and so forth, but not gobs of it. It's sugar. They're all sugar. And sugar, if it raises your blood sugar, is too much for you. And there's going to be a lot of people doing home glucose monitoring or continuous glucose monitoring who don't have diabetes because that's how important it is. Many people can eat sugar all day and it doesn't really impact their health that much, but it's too hard to know if you're one of those. So just assume you're not. Assume that when you eat sugar, it turns to fructose, which does all kinds of metabolic mayhem in your body that you want to avoid. And sugar substitutes? Yeah, anything that's sweet, you know, the artificial sweeteners are at least 100 times sweeter than sugar. And it's too easy to over-sweeten. And what I want people to do is to withdraw from liking sweetness. So you're addicted to the sweetness as much as to the molecule itself. And you can get away from that, but not with artificial sweeteners that are way too, sugar, too sweet. Uh, stevia, if someone tied you up and made you use one, just say, okay, I'll take stevia. Um, and I'd use stevia, but um, even that is way sweeter. And I like to train people, you know, you can drink coffee without sugar. You just have to train yourself to do it. Uh, but the artificial sweeteners do really bad things. Saccharin turns to methyl alcohol when it's metabolized. Methyl alcohol, that's wood alcohol. That causes blindness. I mean, why would you take that? And you'll see all kinds of articles about each of the artificial sweeteners and the metabolic mayhem they cause. You're not doing yourself a favor. People who drink diet soda gain weight and get fat. It tricks your brain. There's a complicated trick that it makes you eat more. It stimulates your appetite. So you think you're losing weight with diet coke? Think again. What over-the-counter vitamins uh, do you recommend for healthy uh, elderly people in good health? Are there risks of taking too many? And is Walgreens brand as good as organic? Uh -huh. So the question is about vitamins. Um, I, again, you can't really make blanket recommendations because each person needs evaluation. Just like I wouldn't just say, take this blood pressure pill for blood pressure, unless I knew more about you. So it needs to be individualized. But in general, it's very hard to imagine why uh, someone 65 and older should not take a vitamin B complex. Pick your brand. I think Walgreens probably does a good enough job that their generic one is probably as good as anybody's because they're a really big outfit and they can afford to do quality control. When they say there's uh, five milligrams of melatonin, there's probably five milligrams of melatonin. Melatonin is an interesting supplement. People take it for sleep. Um, however, your brain makes less than one milligram of melatonin every night to put you to sleep like a baby. Children make gobs of melatonin. They don't need melatonin, but when we get older, we don't make it as much anymore. And when, you, when they analyzed all the bottles of melatonin that were supposed to be five milligrams, they got anywhere from none to 100 milligrams. So when you buy it over the counter, that's what you get. You may get five, or you may get none, or you may get 100. So that's, did you say a brand name? I missed it. A brand name of? Of a vitamin that you prefer or melatonin? No, oh no, I don't do brand name. <laughs> <laughs> no, ma'am. No, so um, a, a B complex is good, especially if you're uh, uh, above age 65. I think trying to get D medicated or D prescribing, they call it, this is getting popular in the dementia literature. Uh, D prescribing, getting people off the sentence if they really, really don't need it, getting them off the anti acid drugs for the stomach if you really, really don't need it. And don't just cut it off cold, and for God's sakes, don't do it without advising, getting the advice of your medical professional. But we, we do a lot of deep prescribing, and I think that's as, probably as effective helping people as anything we do, deep prescribing. I think we should go visit the exhibitors. Is it time? It's time. Okay, so please visit the exhibitors. Um, they're down the hall, talk with them. Even if you yourself don't require their service, maybe somebody you know could benefit from it. So they help us put on this uh, uh, summit and please visit them. And then uh, we'll return for our final session at 11.45, if that's okay. <laughs>